Uh, welcome everybody uh, to the Future Trends Forum. I'm really glad to see all of you here today. We're doing something special in the forum, something we don't often do. Uh, I'll explain what that is in a minute. First, let me explain what the forum is, uh, how it works, where it comes from, and what we hope to accomplish. Now, that's a long introduction. So hello, if that was too familiar. Where we are now is we are starting the fall semester. Some campuses have already begun. Some are just about to. But for all of us in higher education, there is a whole overarching set of questions about this unusual, extraordinary semester. How will we support face-to-face -face instruction? Everything from testing to PPE to plastic shields. If we're not doing face-to-face -face instruction, online, for those of you who are entirely online, how do you manage that? How do you start up for first and first time students? How do you welcome them to a college or university? How do you handle all the technology? How do you handle the faculty support? If you're a faculty, how are you teaching? If you're a student, what is this like? So that's the idea for this session. The session is to hear from you, to hear from all of you. We'd like to hear your stories, your thoughts, your questions, your hopes, your fears, your experiences. This is a kind of open mic. In fact, here, I will give you a literal open mic. Uh, there's a kind of teal colored box next to me now. Uh, if you'd like to join me on stage, just press that button where it says join podium. You'll join the podium and be up here with us. Now, if you can't do that, then just let me know and we can have uh, use the question and answer box. Hello, Terry. Hello, Brian. How are you? Oh, it's so good to see you. How are you doing? I am hanging in there. We've got some smoke around us, as oh, you can imagine. You're in San Francisco, right? Yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so it's been an interesting start to the fall. So you're, you know, when we talk about the world being on fire, yours literally is on fire. Literally, yes. I, I'm very, we're very lucky. We actually, I'm in Menlo Park, which is south of San Francisco, <laughs> but um, we've just had some days where we're just socked in with smoke. Um, today is not one of them, thank goodness. But um, yeah, we're we're uh, hanging in there. Oh my gosh. Oh, Terry. If you don't know Terry, by the way, this is Terry's an extraordinary person. She's been a guest on the program, a terrific guest. Uh, she's a political scientist. She's been all over higher education doing great stuff. And now she runs this great center for higher education leadership, uh, where she helps improve leadership across higher education, which we badly need this right now. <laughs> I know. What, are, what are you seeing from this fall semester? What are, what are you finding out from your your contacts and, and your uh, your uh, charges. What are you hearing about this? Um, I've been having a lot of discussions about this, as you can imagine. And I think the there's two things that I'm seeing, uh, and I have a ton of friends who are faculty who are struggling through all of this, um, but it, it's communication um, and transparency. Those are the two things I think that we're struggling with right now. And the, you, you tell, always talk about, you know, the, well, there's the, you know, you can call it the pivot or um, I forget the term you use. <laughs> yes, toggle semester. I mean, I see so many faculty and students and, and I'm a parent. I just sent my son up to Lewis and Clark College in Portland. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, and so I'm, I obviously I'm feeling fairly comfortable with <laughs> how they're handling things up there. Uh, but um, yeah, and and well, the too much or too little uh, is the question. I, I, it's it's both, right? There's there's some I've seen some faculty complaining. It's like oh my, there's constant barrage of information coming at us, and others saying, I don't understand. You know what 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 will it take for my institution to decide they're going to go online? Um, you know. Is there a, a, a cutoff point where they're going to say, and some it's, you know, and I know as a former provost, I know how hard it is to say, to have a hard and firm, um, you know, if we hit this number of COVID cases, we're going to go online. You know, that's really hard to say because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, you know, mo it's a moving target. Right. So I guess what I'm hearing a lot of from my faculty friends and is, is struggling to figure out, you know, do I, I don't want the constant barrage of email that's maybe not that informative. But on the other hand, I want to know what is what will it take? You know, how how are we going to decide that we're going to to close? I, I, have, I have questions about this, but friends, if, if you know the forum, you know, it's your questions that matter. And if we have Terry here, you've got to pounce. 
And <laughs> well, click that raised hand if you want to join us on stage. You can tell we're friendly. Or just you know go to the question mark and, and type your questions. Well, one question I want to ask you specifically about communication is uh, what do you think about the dashboards that campuses are putting out? You know, I like the dashboards because as a parent, you know, I can tell you I've got the Lewis right now. I could go to the Lewis and Clark College uh, dashboard and find out how many COVID cases they have on campus. Um, and so uh, to me, as a, both a you know, I think as a form of communication, it's wonderful because you, otherwise you're going to have anxious parents, you know, I need to know your numbers, you know, what's going on, you know, and so it's kind of like, you know, I, I've become less obsessive about it, but for a while, you know, I was going almost every day to the, the Johns Hopkins website to see, you know, where the cases, you know, globally, U.S., state, county. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I've definitely slowed down on that. But since I just sent my son up to campus last weekend, I'm watching the the dashboard at uh, uh, Lewis and Clark very closely. And actually, um, I've heard complaints from friends, you know, faculty and other parents that there isn't a dash if there isn't a dashboard. So I think that having a dashboard is really important, but it's also needs to make sure, um, you know, what is you know, what does it mean to, to have a dashboard? What's on it? And so that's another important component. It really varies. I, I did a list. I've got about, I don't know how many now, about 80 or 90. Um, and they're really, really diverse. I mean, you've got uh, everything from uh, um, like really elaborate, very, very detailed dashboards that are generated by uh, Microsoft to uh, people with a couple of numbers. Um, some have little stories, like mm -hmm. water stories. Um, I mean, it's really, really interesting to see. Uh, I don't know what proportion of campuses have them. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, and it raises another question, which is who's doing the research right now? <laughs> um, and because we, we all need to be paying attention to this and from one perspective, from another perspective, I keep telling people there's going to be so much I mean, there's so much data potential out there and we, we, you know, we need to come out of this with some clear understanding of, you know, what's working, what's not, um, you know, who's, who's got, you know, something as simple as who's got a dashboard and who doesn't um, and what has been the response because of that. And so I think there's some really um, interesting questions um, and uh there's some other questions out there, I think. Uh, and, and I don't want to be the only one up here. So somebody else, you know, jump in. Feel free to jump in. <laughs> let, me, let me bring some of these up um, and let me read these because people are, are putting these in the chat. Yeah. Uh, first one is an observation from Myron Williams in Kentucky who says they're doing two to three minute videos sent to everyone. Yeah, Myron, I guess I would want to know how often do you do that? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and Roxanne adds that the Connecticut government updates daily as a PDF type of dashboard. Uh, mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Uh, Lisa Durf um, uh, has a question. She is kind of an ethical, moral question. She asks, I wonder why any institution opened at all. One death is too many. Yeah, I think that last one is an interesting one, you know, because I, I've struggled with this question. You know, my son wanted to get back to campus and, and Oregon overall, besides the what's going on in downtown Portland, has been relatively low set of cases. Um, I think for you know, why send them back at all? You know, I, I know people like Michael Sorrell have been coming out and saying you know, we shouldn't open at all. Um, but I guess my my I think the other side of the equation is that, well, there's several things. First of all, there's students who have to be on campus; they don't have anywhere else to go. Um, so I mean, and what does it mean to open? I don't think we've defined that, right? So, for example, on my son's campus, they have maybe at the most a thousand students on their campus and it, it's mostly remote. There's just a few, you know, it's so it's more a question of, you know, it's hybrid. And and so does that what does hybrid mean? Is that open or, or not? <laughs> you know, and students are going to be living somewhere. Um, and, you know, for my son, I knew he was not going to last he's, he's been he did great over the summer in terms of quarantining and not you know having his pod but i knew that wasn't going to last if he stayed and all of his you know he didn't have friends around so i think for for me personally i'm i feel he's safer in a dorm where they're actually doing the sewage testing and and you know they're they're going to test everybody for covid before they start face to face anything face to face they're doing very limited face to face i mean 
it, is it any better than him being here? Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, good luck to both of you. Yes, thank you. I know of the two of you, I know who's more nervous. Um, <laughs> Easy. That's easy. Um, the uh, we had um, a question. Actually, it's a news story shared by uh, Joel Bloom, who is at Hunter College and he's the director of assessment there. And let me just I'll flash this on the screen, but then I'll show the link. Uh, Anthony Fauci says bringing students to campus and sending them home a couple of weeks later is the worst thing we can do. Yeah, that students will spread it all over. Yeah, I saw that uh, Twitter on Twitter as well. Um, here's the here's the link. Um, I'm, I'll I'll put this on Twitter and make sure everyone can see it too. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to read the story to you uh, right now, as fun as that would be. But that's uh, um, I, I wonder if if Lisa, that's not partially an answer to your question. Um, if campuses are figuring, or if we brought students back and faculty and student and staff. Um, it's less destructive to keep them on campus than to send them home. I'm, I'm hypothesizing here. I haven't heard anybody make, well, no, that's not true. Uh, I've heard a couple of universities make that case. Uh, Cornell uh, actually said they thought that um, they would be so good at public health in their space that students would actually be better off there. Um, so I wonder if we might not see uh, more of these uh, coming up. Um, we had a, another question. I want to make sure we didn't miss this. Uh, it's from the awesome Joe Murphy, who's in uh, Rainy, Ohio. And he said, uh, and this is for you, but also for everybody. Uh, I, he said, I'd love to hear stories about alternative strategies for communication, which are working for people. So that's a, that's a question for everybody. And, and Terry, do you have any that uh, you want to share? Um, it was alternative forms of... Uh, strategies for communicating. Oh, with, alternative strategies for communicating. Yeah. yeah. People. Um, I haven't, well, you know, I haven't heard of anybody doing anything particularly innovative. Um, it, it's basically, you know, I mean, I think people are sticking with the usual email. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, we're still in a phase where people are figuring things out around that. Uh, but it, I don't know if anybody else has any ideas about that. I, I just, yeah, I, I'm thinking about the organizations and institutions I've looked at and I haven't, you know, besides the, you know, um, the, you know, there's video, there's, you know, podcasts. I think probably the most innovative thing I've seen is using Twitter um, live feeds. Uh, I know some folks who are using Twitter live feeds to communicate to students in particular, Instagram live feeds. Um, but, you know, that, that still seems fairly traditional to me. Well, you're an advanced person. I mean, yeah, I know. <laughs> also, 2016. Yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, and we did have um, uh, a follow-up question with that, or an observation from uh, Dean Raj, um, who uh, asks a related question, uh, but it touches on other topics, which is um, how is your institution addressing the digital divide? Those who have access to broadband or computers. So, I want to put that out there for everybody, and then. Um, Terry, I'd love to hear, what are you hearing? What good stories are you hearing about that? Um, and sorry, I'm following the chat and <laughs> trying to listen. So um, run the question by me again. That's okay, that's okay. Digital divide stuff. Uh, oh, yes, 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 sorry. What, um, what, works? Yes. what works? What works? Oh, gosh, um, that's a hard one because, you know, what we're seeing is um, students Going and hanging out in parking lots uh, to to get hotspots. Um, you know, I think that's one of the arguments for bringing you know keeping students on campus, especially low income students who 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 don't have access. And um, I think if you don't mind me pulling in the K through twelve space, this has been a tough one as they yeah. you know have tried to you know give out Chromebook. I mean, not part part of it is you know is how much support you. Know, how much funding resources is a word I'm trying to come to get to. And so the resource issue is a difficult one. This is where I would love to see, this is one area where, you know, the federal government really should be stepping in and providing not specific guidelines, but some resources for institutions to give students hotspots and laptops. It's amazing the number of students who, who just rely on their phone. 
Um, and that's going to have to be another innovation is that we uh, we set things up in a way and there are some companies trying to do this so that students could do most of their work on their phone because that's a one reliable thing that students have is their their cell phone and um, you know they may not have Wi-Fi but at least they can find a cell tower and uh, access it that way you think we'll uh, I mean we, we can talk about how much people can actually write on phones but uh, I, I wonder, I mean, not everyone can do that. Do you think we're going to see a shift in assignments where faculty ask people, all right, if you can't write on your phone, uh, maybe we'll supply you a Bluetooth keyboard or make your assignment a video or audio? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I, I, audio is definitely something I'm seeing. Um, and yeah, I was I was actually looking at the Georgia State case. I need to read the article more carefully because they've actually seen um, an improvement in how some of their students are doing in their classes uh, since they've been uh, innovating with the use of their CARES funds. Um, so yeah, that that's another uh, interesting idea is to use audio and um, you know, allowing students to do assignments, you know, that might be more creative. And, you know, that's where design thinking comes in, you know, it's like, let's not just stick with the usual if it's going to be hard for students. Let's let's brainstorm and figure out some new ways of teaching that will allow students to use their phones and, and so on. So we have people are just living in the in the text chat and they're asking all kinds of questions. But one of them, uh, you know, uh, a few of them point out that uh, there's a lot you can do with phones and there's a long history with this. Um, but also we have someone who wants to join us on stage, the mm -hmm. author, Maria Anderson. She's the uh, Course Tune founder and CEO, former guest on the program and co-host and just an awesome all around person. How are you doing, Maria? I'm doing well. Good. Um, am, I, am I up on the stage or am I? Yes, you are. Great. Cool. Um, I, well, I thought I would share some alternative communication strategies. So um, I actually took a page out of um, corporate world with what we kind of do with stand-ups and created a, a way to flex with that. And then I also went old school uh, because I, I know that we're having so many issues with bandwidth, technology, um, and students are really struggling with the different technologies they're using in all of their classes now because it's not just one class using technology. It's like, this class uses Zoom, and this class uses Teams, and this class uses blah, and this class uses, right? And so I thought, okay, I'm teaching math, so I want to make sure that it says um, that, that technology is not a, the thing that keeps them from learning in this class. So I uh, went to campus on the first day of the semester armed with a large suitcase full of uh, whiteboards. <laughs> and these are whiteboards with a blank side and a, a graph side. Huh. So that's put that up, up, right side up. Yeah. And so all of the students were issued a whiteboard pen and eraser with a label on it for them to write their name and phone number so their whiteboard doesn't wander off from them too far. And uh, when we meet in uh, in class, so I was originally planning to use them in two places. One, in the socially distanced classroom, because it is very difficult to discuss in an active way when everybody's wearing masks and you can't look at the paper next to you, right? Mm -hmm. And so one way uh, I was gonna use them in the classroom was to just like, they could hold their work in front of them and talk to somebody about it, right? Uh, in the end, I ended up teaching remotely, all, but I was planning on using them remotely when we went remote, because I figured it was just a matter of time, um, because I've been using them all summer this way. And it's a lovely way for students to, um, take their hands off their keyboards, do some work in a very safe space where they can erase easily. And then when I need to see the work, I just have the ones who are who have their cameras on show me their work on the screen and we talk about it, talk about it. And then for the ones who don't have cameras on the screen, they're still working on their boards and it does still provide that safe place to make mistakes, right? I think students are a lot you know, what I've observed over the last couple of decades is that students are a lot more willing to try something and make a mistake on a whiteboard than they are on their own paper, right? And so um, that has been working out swimmingly. When they go to their small groups, they can also share in their small groups by holding up their boards to the um, to the, the, the camera, and they don't have to um, have one more technology to use. They don't have to try to write using their touchpad, which is like, a significant detriment in a math and science class to try to do that. 
So I've just taken the technology down a, a, a lot uh, for what uh, is required to participate with graphs and diagrams and mathematical notation and things like that. And I do know that some schools have used CARES funding to purchase uh, whiteboards for all their students in particular, like I know K-12 district that purchased 3,500 of them for their every one for every student in the district so they can use them in all their classes. Um, and uh, certainly like on campuses, the STEM fields could all say like, hey, let's issue one whiteboard to every student and use this, right? Because you could use it both in the classroom and in the remote classroom. So it's uh, cool. Yeah. Uh, you got a lot of fans of this in the uh, chat box. People are yeah. here for the uh, low tech solution. Yeah, and then the other communication strategy I thought I'd share has to do with that stand up kind of mentality. So I had all of my videos recorded um, in a, all my lectures, you know, in small chunks recorded in a previous semester and captioned and all that stuff because I was teaching it online. So this year, um, along with their whiteboards, they were issued the guided notes for those videos, which are incomplete notes and they have to fill in the rest by watching videos and trying problems where it says to try the problem and things like that. And so in the first, we meet for two hours twice a week remotely. And in that first hour of class, maybe first 45 minutes of class, they get the time to either watch videos if they haven't done it or work with each other on the assignments in small groups. So anybody who's watched their videos has kind of an advantage because they can go and, and work on answering questions in their groups. And uh, for those that have uh, not watched the videos yet, they can get that done before we get to our active learning session. Uh, we use the whiteboards and do all that stuff. But the thing that's different about it, which I think is really awesome as well, the students are working during that first hour. Yeah. I have the time to text the students who aren't in class text students who maybe have missed an assignment and find out what's going on. I make one extra breakout room when I make my Zoom breakout room. So if I if I really want, if I if I want like four in a breakout room, I just make one, I like increase it to make one extra breakout room. And then I just bump students out of that breakout room immediately into other rooms. And then I use that extra breakout room for myself to meet with students. So I will just bump students into that breakout room if I need to have a conversation with them. And then we have a private place to chat with each other about what's going on, why their assignments aren't turned in, et cetera, right? But that 45 minutes at the beginning of class, I can use that as like an active get a hold of students. I know they're not in another class right now, they're in my class, right? And I can have private conversations with them in that breakout room or via text. And uh, they're not disturbing anyone else, we're not disturbing the rest of the class. And so that's worked really well too, as a kind of something I haven't ever really done before, because there hasn't been the opportunity to do that before. Well, that's a, I mean, I, I keep telling you this whenever I see you, as I say, I envy your students. Um, and I had terrible math experiences, so that's, that says a lot. Um, you can come back and have a good one now. I'm, I'm tempted to. What, the, what, what, were you, what are you teaching? Uh, so I'm teaching a class called Functions Modeling Change, and it's a modern contemporary version of a pre-calculus class where we mostly look at real world data for everything. So we take we tackle everything from the perspective of uh, what you would be seeing out there in the real world. It's actually where graphs in the world graphs in the world was born out of this class because uh, there was such a need to be able to find graphs easily to look at. And um, yeah, so it's just a lot of like looking at today we looked at the growth of Slack, the growth of Microsoft Teams, the uh, periodic behavior of uh, emergency room visits in Utah for respiratory illnesses. And uh, what else did we look at? I can't remember, but a couple other things in class. Oh, examples. Yeah. So, so people were asking about the alternative communications and uh, you brought it to them, especially embedded in class. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Can you stay up on stage for a bit with us? Sure, yeah, and I'm gonna share, if you don't mind, I'm gonna share in the chat window the Graph in the World website in case people don't know about it. It's kind of a mm -hmm. fun way to learn about um, all of the different uh, things going on in the world through more than just the last data point. So there's a Facebook, there's an Instagram, and there's a Twitter account you can follow, uh, depending on what poison you'd like. I just, yeah. I just repeated that so to make sure everyone can see it, because not everyone's in the same. Oh, oh right. right. No, it's no problem. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Graphs in the World. Um, we had uh, another question from um, another wonderful person in the uh, a longtime supporter and uh, someone with far too good a sense of humor. 
Uh, we've got uh, Tom Ames uh, coming to us from the Houston, Texas area. Um, and Tom, I guess the, uh, hang on a second. Tom, the first question I want to ask is just how hot is it there? Oh, I don't know. It's probably in the upper 90s, but we have a lot of humidity, so. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You wilt in Houston. I th it's, it's funny because I used to have people working for me who are from Nigeria, and they complained about the heat and humidity in Houston, Whoa. so that says something. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, well, among, um, among other virtues, you have, a, you have a great habit of asking very good questions. Uh, one of them was your question oh. about uh, physical presence and the college experience. And I'm just wondering if you could unfold that observation slash question a bit and toss it to Maria and Terry and then give everybody a chance to uh, dig into it. Well, sure, absolutely. Um, first of all, I, I, I want to say, Maria, uh, I, I've been doing the same thing with whiteboards except giving, uh, suggesting them for faculty. I don't have them to give, but people are like, I want to use this complicated digital whiteboard. And I'm like, why? Just hold the damn thing up, you've got a camera, <laughs> you know? Yeah, or, <laughs> and, uh, or, or a document camera, which you, you actually can almost not buy yeah. because they're all out of stock, but like mm. a document yeah. camera is another yeah. like, super simple solution for faculty who are not used to a lot of technology. Yeah. And I'm used to technology and I still default to using the document camera over like screenwriting any day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I, I, I want to riff on my question a little bit because I mean it was it was from the part of the conversation that was uh, ten or fifteen minutes ago, <laughs> um, but uh, that's okay. That's the way this works. I get that. Um, you know, I mean, one of the things is, uh, and this gets back to your whiteboard thing. And oh, by the way, how dare you make math concrete? So just stop I that know. right now. It's tough. Oh, stop it. I had a oh, student bad. today ask um, me. Can we use X and Y? Is it okay? <laughs> it's like I never use X and Y anymore. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I feel your pain. I try. I try to relate government to students. It's every bit as abstract in a lot of ways. So, um, no, uh, the 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 thing that I kind of wanted to get at here is that uh, relating to my earlier question is this concept that physical presence equals learning. And I mean, I know there's a lot of ways in which we use modalities in a physical world that we don't even think about. I mean, that we've learned over years of practice, uh, either intentional or unintentional, most of it unintentional, when it comes to communicating in an in-person environment. And it is, it is definitely dislocating uh, to have that part of it taken away or, uh, or distanced out. But, you know, we have a vast panoply of communication tools um, it's not like people have to be isolated by this technology. Uh, you can, as, as Maria is doing, uh, uh, it just demonstrated very clearly how she's doing it. You know, you can touch your students and listen to them and, and, and in such a, in the same way that you can in an in-person environment. And there are many things that, you know, undiscovered opportunities about this current situation in terms of things that I've kind of been thinking about doing for a long time, but kind of suddenly have been forced into doing, like putting a lot more content online just because it's like, oh, I'll get to it tomorrow. Well, now I have to do it by tomorrow. Um, and so that asynchronous part of my class is completely shoved off the table. And I've been very brutal about saying, okay, do I really need to do this live? Do I really need to do that live? And so my in-person classes now are almost exclusively Okay, what are you working on? Okay, do you understand this? Um, uh, let's let's talk about some some trip tricks and techniques for how do you can understand this better. Work your project forward, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the thing that always crops up in my mind is these schools are struggling with uh, whether to open or not. Is there's almost no discussion about where the learning's actually occurring. I mean, I know there's some physical things and there's a small percentage of classes that require things like physical labs and, and other things which are hard to work around. And it sucks for football, I get that. Um, but uh, uh, at the same time, there's so little discussion about, okay, well, fine, this isn't working out the way we expected, but learning doesn't have to stop. And um, I'm just wondering, I, I, it's kind of a question slash observation, but you know, have you guys seen this discussion happening about learning specifically at most institutions? Because I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it very much. I see it among the faculty, some, but a lot of times the faculty are deer in the headlights uh, at this point. 
right? Because, and they're being, in some ways, sometimes the institutions actually trip up the learning because they insist on, we're going to do it this way, period, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm things, just curious what your observations are. Yeah, so one of the things I found interesting was we got a, an email from um, one of the deans early on in the summer that said, you know, we all know that in-person teaching is better than online and remote teaching for all of these reasons. And I was like, I completely disagree with this. Right? And it, it was interesting as the summer progressed that that message changed, you know, uh, over time. and. There was a point at which the college said, if you've proven that you can teach remotely in an excellent fashion, then we will let you do it because it can be, it can be superior to the current, you know, uh, in-person experience that, and I think that was the consequence of running out of classroom space, honestly. Um, but uh, it was interesting to see that message change, but I am actually willing to put my foot, my a line in the sand here and say that my remote teaching class is better than my in-person one. Because I, I would actually students, probably say that about my own class as well at this point. Yeah, I'm seeing, yeah. I can get that personal connection during the first 45 minutes with every student I need to connect with, but it's hard to get a hold of them otherwise, and I have the time to do it, right? And then we do active stuff for the rest of the class. I can get them in and out of groups like that. There's no social yeah. awkwardity where, like, a student's like, I don't have a group. Nobody likes me. You know, like, that's all gone, right? Yeah. And as long as you know the pedagogy behind it, you know to like have students try a problem before you send them to a group, right? So that they have something to discuss when they get there. Uh, as long right. as you're good at the pedagogy, I think remote teaching is actually far superior to face-to-face -to -face in many, many ways. And I can play with space and time in a way that I can't in a physical classroom. There's nobody driving me out of my classroom at the end of an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, there, there's no expectation necessarily that the students are there. You know, if it makes more sense to, to talk to a student at a time that's not part of class time, I don't have to drive into campus for that. Yeah. I just fire up a Zoom session. I can do that anytime. I've got a week and a half of class scheduled in, or a week of class scheduled in October and again in November. That's going to be nothing but individual meetings. You know, hey, what's going on? How's it going? What are you struggling with in the class or in general? How can we get you through this? Right? Yeah. That's what I'm doing. I, that's really hard to pull off in person because everybody has to be physically in the same place. Sorry, Brian. It's okay. Let me yeah. pause you just for a second because some people have come in. I just want to make sure that everyone um, who's come in yep. since we started is welcome. Uh, and as you can tell, we're engaged in an open mic, freewheeling discussion about the fall semester. Uh, we've been talking about communication, we've been talking about te technology, we've been talking about pedagogy, uh, and now we're in a great discussion about balance, you know, trying to compare face-to-face -face versus online teaching. Um, yeah, and I think we have to be careful. I mean, first of all, I wanna say I have friends who are are now teaching, teaching online for the first time and just amazed at how well it's going. Um, so that's one side of it. The other side of it is a lot of our, unfortunately in higher ed, a lot of our faculty don't know anything about pedagogy. Right, um, oh, and, I talk to them all the time. I know what you're talking about. Yes, and but the third point I wanna make is that, you know, we have the situation where some people are teaching, you know, maybe 20 people in a class, but what, what are we doing for the people teaching 300, 400 in a class, you know, they don't have the time to do that one-on-one. -on -one. Well, they wouldn't regardless. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's normal in a sense, but um, I, I this, think- This doesn't work in that scenario. I mean, the, yeah. Yeah, you're right about that. So, yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing, to, one thing to look at, and, uh, and I will hat tip to Ruben Pontadura on this, but is that, you know, look at the open university example. And, you know, they had classes with thousands of people in them, but, they operated around the basis of small groups of tutorials of 10, maybe 20 people assigned to a tutor. And that person was actually doing the real teaching at that point. The, the, the professor was uh, providing the high level content, bringing all that down, but the tutor was the one who was making sense of it to the students, right? That's what we need to be looking at. And whether that tutor is a grad student or uh, other professor or whatever, 300 people, for a lot of students, that doesn't work anyway. Right? You might true. as well be by yourself remotely sitting in a large lecture hall with 500 students. I've been there. That's what I did in my undergraduate years. But well, I'm fortunate to teach at a community college where we have much smaller classes. Sorry, Brian. Can mm -hmm. I have to Raj's question here? Okay. Hang, hang on one second. This, one just yeah. this, up. this is from uh, Ryan Downey, who's a prof at Georgetown University and is also one of my students. 
um, which is uh, remarkable. He's a, a glutton for punishment. Um, and uh, I want to put this up so you can all see it. The comment about having an online course being better than a face-to-face -face course, I wonder what the panel thinks the idea of the one design strategy that I've heard about in some of the educator groups. So uh, just to be clear, I said my remote course is better than my face-to-face -face course. Uh -huh. I, I think that that the hacked version of an online course that I've been teaching for the last two years, which includes a remote component, is also better than the face-to-face. -face. But the, I think the traditional asynchronous, no common time to meet, I, I actually think it, it does miss a little bit from a face-to-face -face class. But I think we have this opportunity right now where colleges have now figured out they can offer remote teaching and schedules and it's okay, right? We finally have it as a, as a possibility in schedules. And so maybe we can shift from having only online and only face-to-face -to, -face to online, remote, or face-to-face. -face. And I think that um, just allowing online courses to have a scheduled meeting day and time is like a huge leap forward for us because there is still so much that students get a benefit from from not having to drive to campus. No childcare, no traffic, no car, right? I don't feel so good today. Like all of these are reasons to not show up physically on campus and having the sessions be remote still meets a need for them. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, that's just my initial thought. Well, that's okay, that's okay. Um, uh, Terry, what do you think? Tom, what do you think? And uh, do we I think teaching is like jazz. I think we've all been given a different set of instruments, but that doesn't mean we can't make music with it. Very nice. Yeah, well said. I've heard some pretty bad jazz. <laughs> I, I was muted there. Um, I muted myself because there's a little noise in the background. But um, I, you know, I, I think that we. I would just love to see that that what comes out of all of this is us to be more student centered. Um, and you know, I've I've spent my career in you know Stanford, UCLA, University of Washington, University of Texas at Austin, and my my last one was more student centered, Menlo College, because I wanted to be at a more student centered place. But I think woohoo. Um, the broader issue is that, you know, to kind of take it up to the 30,000 foot level is that we don't have a commitment to teaching and being student centered in our R1 institutions. And that has to change. <laughs> so uh, we need to teach graduate students how to teach. Um, you know, we need to make sure that what we're doing is in the best interest of the students. You know, are, are we, you know, how are we designing spaces how are we designing you know if we're if we're going to be face to face but if we're going to be online how are we designing those those courses that it's reach you know for every and we know that and i'm going to pull in the diversity hook because here you know we need to how, you know, but it's an issue of accessibility not only in terms of you know learning disabilities and stuff, but accessibility for students who don't have the same resources as, as you know they, they may we talked we we're talking about this at the beginning the digital divide um and so at every institution, there are going to be some subset of students who need more help. And whether it's because of financial Power. reasons or because they are, uh, you know, have learning disabilities. I have a son who's got ADHD and I'm struck, we're all struggling with how to deal with this from a remote <laughs> learning perspective. Um, and we're finally getting some traction with his school, but um, you know, what's gonna happen when he goes to college? You know, I have to look at institutions that actually care about this stuff. <laughs> so. so Terry, do you think the lack of teaching focus is related to the decision making around whether to open or not in person? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> you know, I, it's hard to answer that, right? Um, yeah, there's the devil there. Um, I got my horns on. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I think it's that's a you know, and I've had this, this discussion with people. I, I think it's more complicated. I think it's a very complicated decision. Um, and I, I would hate to impute anything on these leaders when I'm not sitting there watching their, you know, how they're making these decisions because I know how, you know, I mean, you can't disaggregate the, the, the you know, we all want to say, and I, I was saying this the other day, is that, um, so if you'd follow me on LinkedIn, I have a lot of fun. Today. LinkedIn, Twitter, I'm, a, I'm on all those things and there's not too many Terry Givenses out there. So please feel free to follow me because I'm, I'm having these, these discussions out there because it's important. It's We're at a phase where higher ed 
has to change. And, um, you know, but what direct, are we going to go in the right direction? And, and I think that a lot of decisions that are being made, you know, how damaging is it if an institution is closed and all the businesses around it suffer and, you know, people are losing their livelihoods and, you know, I mean, I, I you know, I'm not, totally bought into the, the the debate that some people are having, you know, that, you know, we need to open up because it's economic. But I, I, I am open to the idea that if we can do it in a safe way, I mean, my goal would be the federal government should and state government should step in, give higher ed enough funding to get through this year online, but also to support local communities, um, to support anybody who needs economic health and give us a year to get through this and figure out how we can figure, how can we can do this in a way that makes sense? We're not, this is not making sense right now. I think that's what it comes down to. Everything we're doing, whether it's remote or face-to-face -face or whatever we're doing, it's not making sense because we don't have that, we don't have a safety net. We need a one-year safety net um, that would allow everybody to say, okay, we're all gonna take a deep breath and look at how to do this. We're gonna share, I mean, and collaboration. That's the other thing I wanna make sure I brought up today is collaboration. Everybody should be talking to everybody else about how best to do this because we, we have some great minds out there that are doing amazing things and we should be learning from each other. We should be sharing resources. You know, We should be giving funding to people like Maria who are, are doing this really in a great way and, and helping her spread the word. Um, you know, it, it's funny because we, we, we're pretty good at collaboration in higher ed, but for some reason, when it comes to these bigger issues, we don't seem to be able to find a way to, to work with each other and figure out what the best practices are. And it's like we're, we're, we're so caught up in the competition that we, we can't get take a step back and say, this is not a time for competition. Is I was, was just going to say, I think right. it's a competition problem, right? Like, every institution of higher ed is competing with every other institution of higher ed for students. And when you threw all of them into this uncertainty bath of will students come back, it got kind of like people, on the one hand, I think there was a lot of sharing like publicly with, you know, faculty support stuff and like whatever you could to try to, you know, help as many people as possible. And on the other hand, I think there was a circling of the wagons, like, Mm -hmm. We need our students to come back to us. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't matter what's best for students. Mm -hmm. It's what's best to bring students back to us, right? right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's 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 really hard. Like, how do we get past the competition aspect of, you know, there's a real competition between community colleges and four-year schools, between yeah. Yeah. one schools and 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 more like neighborhood four-year schools, and like, you know, we it is a real issue. Mm -hmm. I want to. Uh, Point uh, Roxanne in the chat, uh, wonderful Roxanne was pointing out the question of timers, uh, which may be a gentle hint to me. Um, but we are uh, we are we are um, going to be running out of time in about eight minutes. Uh, I, it goes I, by too fast. Well, you guys are just, are just splendid, and people are all over you guys on the chat on Twitter. Uh, I did want to ask if, if we could look ahead a little bit. This is what I was doing in the quarter of this. Uh, well, first, quick question, Terry. Um, people wanted to know. Where to follow you to get your to get the most Terry Givens? Would that be uh, LinkedIn? Or would that be Twitter? Or um, all of the above. I'm big on social media, so I'm at, I'll, I'll, I'm putting it in the chat, and actually, um, I'll let you can copy and, and paste it for those who. So Twitter is at Terry Givens, and then just you know look for me, Terry Givens on LinkedIn. I have a Facebook page, but I'm not that active on it. Um, and I just posted some more mental health resources because Raj was asking about that. So um, we have a whole set of articles and things on, on faculty mental health. Uh, so um, yes, please feel free to follow me. I'm and because I, I mean, my, one of my goals is, I mean, we're going to be actually starting a, a some more um, like a weekly something like this, but more focused on what's you know, the news and higher ed and, and leadership and, and those kinds of things. We're going to start a weekly discussion soon in the next few weeks um, to kind of we, we have to stay on top of this. And so my solution to the collaboration issue is to get out there and start talking to people and saying, you know, knocking heads and saying, you know, let's do this. Um, you know, we should definitely be, be talking together more about how, and we have this window of opportunity uh, this fall semester to say, okay, who's doing the things right? Who's doing things wrong? Um, so anyway, yes. Let me uh, um, 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Downs just uh, wants you to write a blog. So I'm just sharing that with you. Just so you <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, oh, can I add something to Raj's question about faculty uh, emotional support? Please. I think one of the best things for me that's come out of this pandemic mm -hmm. is that um, I formed a group, uh, like a yoga group that meets for 30 minutes a day with friends from all over the country. And um, we have met on a weekday at four o'clock every day since like March. And um, because we're mostly educators, we talk about what's going on, how we're doing, and what weird things happened in class and what our campuses are doing. And it gives us a, a kind of like a water cooler uh, to just, uh, and we just, we all do yoga on an app, but you could clearly do the same thing over coffee or, you know, something else. Yoga just gives us a reason to show up and stretch ourselves, which we need because we're all standing at desks all day or sitting at desks all day. But that like regular, somebody always shows up at four o'clock. There's like 15 of us and there's always at least three people who show up and you've got somebody to talk to and, and just I think we all kind of need that. And that for me and for most of the people in this group has been our primary form of emotional support. It's like this little tiny bit of normalcy in a weird sea of uncertainty. I love that. I love that. Uh, I've got some thoughts about it, but I, I want to I want to bring this bring this right back to you. And Raj, as usual, thank you for the great question. Uh, Heather Zhang, oh, I want to say Zhang, um, forgive me if I mispronounce it, Heather, it says that uh, we should, this should be a national response with fires, hurricanes, unemployment, social unrest, COVID-19, et cetera, to advocate for all letters, for all learners. The, the question I'm wondering about is if we look ahead to January, uh, what, do you, what are we learning about um, higher ed in this situation that we can apply in the next year? Uh, I know it's kind of a stretch to think that far ahead uh, to the next year, but there's a long way to go between now and then. But looking ahead, what are, I mean, are we, uh, do you think we're rethinking competition? Do you think we're uh, becoming more accustomed to online learning or at least digitally mediated learning? Or you know, what kind of changes are you seeing looking ahead? I, uh, real quick, I just see us muddling along. Lot of, lot of uh, I think I, it's going to become even more Lord of the Flies as the cuts that we're starting to see right now really start to bite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we're it'll gonna start see permeating throughout the community in a way that it hasn't really yet. I don't think. I think we're going to see a decoupling of the social aspects of higher education from the educational aspects of higher education to the point where we finally realize that dorms could be used by other 18 and 19 year olds who aren't going to go to college but need a place away from home for a little while to get used to, yeah. you know, being away from home and easing into the adult world and having some contact with other young people. And like, there's a need for, there's really a social need for that, right? And we're seeing that in the colleges that have reopened specifically to meet those needs. But I don't think that that has to be tied to the educational needs of students. And I think that's gonna to start to decouple the seams. Well, that's a very powerful image. Uh, Thank you, thank you. But we have, and I love the muddling. But Tom, hang on a second. I need to clear some room on the stage. I'm going to push you off just for a minute. Uh, you can push me off too. I can push me off too. Yeah. Yeah. We push off. Very, I, I want to hold on to you for a minute because we have uh, Rebecca um, uh, Pope Rourke wanted to come up, and uh, she's a wonderful person who uh, we've had as a guest. Um, and uh, I want to see uh, if we can, uh, if we can least hear from her. Um, and, uh, and, and maybe Samir, we'll see. Um, Rebecca does all kinds of great work on uh, faculty um, uh, burnout and faculty stress. Rebecca, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious, um, you know, looking ahead, where do you think faculty are going to be in about four months? You know, are we just going to be fried? Um, are we going to have more takeouts like the one in, uh, I believe, Iowa? Uh, or are we going to are we going to kind of reduce our assessment and intensity of students? Uh, what do you think? Uh, I mean, it could go so many directions. My hope is that faculty members will um, will find some groups or create some groups that help them muddle, help them do the muddling through um, some kind of support networks. Um, and I've said before, one of the things that that has come out of this um, this whole situation unexpectedly 
is that faculty seem to be more willing to share their humanity with other faculty um, and, and also with their students. So I'm hoping that will extend into um, mastermind groups or just kind of peer mentoring groups that faculty can use to share ideas, to, to say, I don't know what's happening and I'm confused um, uh, and to get some ideas, kind of you know, faculty mentoring teams. Um, if, if we don't do that, yeah, we are all gonna be fried by the end of the semester. Um, I know people who are fried now, right? You know, that, that we, we didn't really get a summer to prepare for this or prepare mentally for this and we dove right into it. Um, um. And do you mind if I ask you, Rebecca, yeah. real quick, because one of the things I've been thinking about is the fact that we didn't have the summer. And when you say that, do you mean it's because you didn't get the word that you were going online quickly enough or or, or what was that? Um, well, I'm in a center for teaching and learning. So I you know, spent the summer helping with multiple units across my institution, helping to prepare faculty for what's coming in mm -hmm. the fall. So I'm at Georgia Tech and we still are. Um, partially face-to-face, -face, mostly hybrid at this, at this time. Um, so, but, but we're hearing from faculty that they, they put so much effort and, and, um, and really, I mean, for some of them, this is the first time they've considered pedagogy at large, you know, that. Right. Um, exactly. That's what yeah. I was saying. Yeah. yeah. So we, I mean, we were starting from the ground up with some, some folks and, you know, we had wonderful faculty who were mentoring other faculty, but there was never that time to really kind of process things. It was, you know, the rush up. All of our classes in the summer were online. So we had folks doing that. It's that run up and then you get there and then you're waiting for the other shoe to drop, right? You're waiting for the signal to go all remote. Um, so you never really feel like you're in one place or one connected space at the same time. And yeah, that's be, taxing, yeah. you know, because yeah, sorry, I was just having a discussion with somebody yesterday about this that, you know, we, we kind of wasted the summer because decisions weren't made quickly enough. Mm -hmm. well, the, uh, according to uh, the Chronicle of Higher Ed, as of Monday, 24% uh, of higher ed still doesn't have a full plan announced. Wow. Wow. Um, but uh, speaking of being belated, uh, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. And everyone, everyone to pay attention to Rebecca. And Harry, <laughs> thank you for being an impromptu guest and spending. Sure. <laughs> I know, I just got nice to I'm not, you know, what, you, whatever. <laughs> let, me just, let me just quickly ask the uh, the crowd um, this kind of session, would you like us to do more of this? Uh, just put it in the chat um, if you like. Um, I'd be glad to, uh, of course, as the chief cat herder of this. Um, and I'd love to hear from you. Um, and, uh, oh, shoot, I'm, I'm, we've just popped over the edge of the hour. Um, yep. Rebecca, thank you again. Um, Thanks, everybody. Uh, Terry, thank you again. And uh, of course, this is uh, 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 my thanks as well to Tom and to Maria for sharing so much. Um, let me just uh, quickly bring up uh, where we are headed before I let you all go. Um, uh, and thank you again for uh, being flexible and letting us uh, explore today. I really appreciate that. Thank you all for all of your questions and stories and thoughts. I uh, just want to let you know that we are uh, continuing to thrum along the next couple of months. We've got a whole stack of sessions. I mentioned the topics earlier, so if you want to learn more about those, just go to tinyurl.com slash forumfall2020. Um, we have lots of social media places for talking about this kind of stuff. Uh, Twitter is really in the lead, but people are also at us on uh, LinkedIn and on uh, Facebook. Um, we have an archive which now cracked 221 videos going back almost five years. So if you'd like to go back into the past and look at the different ways that we've explored these topics, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, in the meantime, uh, again, thank you all so much for your energy, your contributions, your discussion, your conviviality. Um, above all, please, good luck this fall and stay safe. Uh, I'd be glad to hear from you all. Take care. Bye-bye.